Today, um, I'll try to discuss uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 6, Texts 8 and 9. As I tried preparing, I realized I had made a grave error the other day. 
portioning out the classes. Well, this purport looks short, but it's really substantive, and the other purport is longer, and of course, even more substantive, and there's just so much. <laughs> oh, but anyway, there's a lot. And I have a problem sometimes paring things down to fit into whatever it is my TED talk allows, 17 and a half minutes or something. There is a. 35. There is a. Uh, oh, it's two TED talks. Um, there's a kind of. There's some awards called the Ig Nobel Awards. And um, it's uh, awards given to people who have written papers that make some really strange or bizarre or just out to lunch assertion in, in the, some field of science. And uh, I think they give them like two minutes for their acceptance speeches. And once the two minutes get, uh, 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 comes, like in the Oscars, they'd have the band start to play the guy off or something like that. They just have like an eight-year-old girl in pigtails who stands up and says, I'm bored, please stop. I'm bored, please stop until the, whoever it is stops. <laughs> So maybe that's what I need sometimes. So uh, text eight. Aisha. Aisha. Di. Di. Ashesha satvanam. Ashesha satvanam. I'm getting get it. Aisha yesh. Aisha yeshesha satvanam. Aisha yeshesha satvanam. Atmansha. Paramatmana, Paramatmana, Atangsha Paramatmana, Atangsha Paramatmana. I'm sorry, that, that was Atmangsha Paramatmana, Atmangsha Paramatmana. Adyo, Adyo, Apataro, Apataro. Yatraso, Adyo Bataro Yatraso, Bhutagrama, Vibhavyate, Bhutagramo Vibhavyate, Aisha Yashesha Satvanam, Aisha Yashesha Satvanam, Atmangsha Paramatmana, Atmangsha Paramatmana, Adyo Bataro Yitraso, Adyo Bataro Yitraso, Bhutagramo Vibhadite, Bhutagramo Vibhadite. Aisha Yashesha Satvanam, Aisha Yashesha Satvanam, Atmang Shaparamatmana, Adyo Bataro Yatraso, Adyo Bataro Yatraso, Utagramo Vipavite, Utagramo Vipavite.
Synonyms, Asia, Asia this, 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 it, me, certainly, Ashesha, unlimited, Satvanam, living entities, Atma, self, Angsha, heart, Parama Atmana, of the super soul, Adya, the first, the first. Avatara, Avatara, incarnation, incarnation. Yatra, Yatra, whereupon, whereupon. Asau, all those, Bhuta Brahma, the aggregate, aggregate creation. And and creations. Flourish. Flourish. Translation. The gigantic universal form of the Supreme Lord is the first incarnation and plenary portion of the super soul. He is the self of an unlimited number of living entities, and in him rests the aggregate aggregate creation which thus flourishes. Um, responsibly, please. The gigantic universal form, gigantic universal form of, the Supreme Lord of the Supreme Lord is the first incarnation, the first incarnation and plenary portion, and plenary portion of, the super soul. of the super soul. He is the self of an unlimited number of living entities. And in him rests the aggregate creation, which thus flourishes. Should Prabhupada's purport. Uh, the Supreme Lord expands himself in two ways by personal plenary expansions and separated. Minute expansions. Okay, so yesterday one three ten. Now we've got another number, right? Um, the personal plenary expansions are Vishnu tattvas, and the separated expansions are the living entities. Okay, so let's do a pop quiz. Anyone here who is part of the former category, the personal plenary expansions? Raise your hand. Oh, we're off. This is this is a good start. And those who are part of the other category, separated expansions, raise your hands. Since the living entities are very small, they are sometimes described as the marginal energy of the Lord. But the mystic yogis consider the living entities and the super soul. Paramatma to be one and the same. It is, however, a minor point of controversy. After all, everything rests on the gigantic virat, or universal form, of the Lord. Text 9. Sadhyatma sadhidhaivascha sadhibhuta hititridha. Oh, back to the threes. Virat prano dasha vidha ekata vidhaena cha. So, and the tens and the ones. But we have to pay a little bit of attention. 
The, the translation, the gigantic universal form is re represented by 3, 10, and 1 in the sense that he is the body and the mind and the senses. He is the, di the dynamic force for all movements by 10 kinds of life energy. And he is the one heart where life energy is generated. So we had yesterday we had a lit we had some discussion of the uh, the three the you know the tree vita the dasha vita and, 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 and the one. So now we have a kind of um, maybe f more focused sense of what that means. So the ten is the ten kinds of life airs that uh, that move throughout the universe, but also um, move throughout the body by the influence of the. Um, the, the, the jiva who's present, and the jiva is connected with the paramatma. And uh, so, Srila Prabhupada's purport. In Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that there are eight elements, earth, water, fire, air, sky, mind, intelligence, and false ego. Um, that the eight elements are all products of the Lord's inferior energy. Whereas the living entities who are seen, as, seen to utilize the inferior and inferior energy originally belong to the superior energy, the internal potency of the Lord. So we see in those verses, Mumirapo Narobayo Kamano Hamikara. They have these eight things, and then he says, "These are, but these these are the divisions of my inferior energy." So this is one way to end. We have different ways all these numbers. There are different ways of analyzing um, all these different things. Um, we've got, we had 24 a couple weeks ago. And now we've got the eight, you know, the, eight, the eight elements and then you have their objects and then you've got the mind and uh, so many things. Um, but Krishna said the, the, the essential point here is Krishna says these, these are uh, all aspects of my inferior energy. And then he says in the next verse, uh, in text five, he says, but there's another energy which is superior to all of them and which exploits them, um, which uh, I think Prabhupada uses, utilizes here. Yeah, utilize the inferior, inferior energy. Now, we can exploit them or we can engage them. That's really our choice. And, you know, in some ways, you can, you know, when we talk about free will, that's essentially the extent of our free will. Uh, we can choose to exploit these um, inferior, inferior energies while we're in contact with them, or to engage them um, in the service of the origin of all things. The eight inferior energies work grossly and subtly, whereas the superior energy works as the central generating force. This is experienced in the human body. The gross elements, namely earth, etc., form the gross body and are like a coat, whereas the subtle mind and false ego act like the inner clothing of the body. Um, so you got your coat, you got your regular clothes, or you got your regular clothes, and you got your undergarments, um, or something. And to the extent that we identify with these things, we have a problem. This is why we have. And, well, we identify with these with these things to one extent or another, and that can create problems. So what? Um, as I get dressed every morning, I grumble about uniforms. I, I'm not, I, I was in the Navy for three years and that experience made it really clear to me that I'm not into uniforms. I can do them when I need to, but oh man, uh, as soon as I got back to the barracks, I would get out of that stuff. Um, so, that, but the uniforms are, are meant to help us um, remember what we're about um, in a sense, in some sense or another. So when, if you work at uh, Lowe's, your uniform is a blue vest. Uh, and, and, and your main uh, business is to become invisible. 
<laughs> right? Especially if, there's, especially if there's customers in the store. Yeah, exactly. Just, I mean, if you actually need help with something, try finding one of those folks with the blue vest. Or, and it's weirder at Home Depot because they're orange, and all of a sudden, they're gone. <laughs> we think it's, the, it's supposed to be there to help us find them when we need to figure out where to find those little screw bands or whatever it is we wanted to get to fix the, the long fruit picker. Uh, but they, the, the, as soon as as soon as a question comes into our mind, of course, the uh, associates become invisible. When you're in the military, it's to help you remember who you are. I'm here to serve the nation as part of this particular unit. I've got this particular chain of command, etc. Um, in in religious orders, it helps us identify ourselves as um, you know as brothers or sisters. Um, or, or whoever. Now, the thing is, if we identify too closely with those things, we lose track of who we actually are. And, and with the clock. Um, we lose track of who we actually are. And I was just thinking, I was singing in Kirtan, and I was, you know, I would, sometimes I, I'll find myself in my head and I'm trying to analyze what's wrong with my voice. And, and then I start thinking about all the different parts of the body that I'm not. And, and what the heck is it that's in here trying to make this voice work right? Um, and it's the same thing, um, you know, you know when, when, when I'm doing anything. And of course, that becomes more problematic as the um, machine starts to fall apart. <laughs> and, and they do, um, I'm here to tell you. So, um, it used to be when everything worked in a more integrated way, it was a little, uh, sometimes a little more difficult to distance yourself from it, but now you really want to. Oh, I am not that body. You know, my goodness, I am really not that body. <laughs> when we're young, strong, alive, and pretty, uh, you know, we, you know, you're looking in the mirror, you're putting on your T lock, and you're thinking, eh, maybe I'm not that body, but maybe I'm a little bit that body. <laughs> <laughs> then when you get older and and got uh, Pony Express bags under your eyes and, and creases. Well, if you're lucky, you have creases like our friend Chaturatma. Chaturatma's face is just like one, he's so, his entire adult life has been so much with that huge grin of his, that he's got these crevices all in his face. It's not just a couple of smile lines, his whole face is like a constellation of smile lines. And, it's, and, I, and, and it, whenever I see Chaturatma, I just think, man, I'm a real selfless after all. But um, so anyway, so, so we, we, you know, the idea is to kind of figure out who I am in all this and, and, and where, uh, where I might be. So Shana Prabhupada continues, the movements of the body are first generated from the heart. And all the activities of the body are made possible by the senses, powered by the ten kinds of air within the body. The ten kinds of air are described as follows, and we saw that in the previous verse, uh, in the seventh verse, and we will see we see it here again. The main air passing through the nose in breathing is called the prana. The air which passes through the rectum as evacuated bodily air is called apana. So now we have a nicer name for that. Less appealing maybe to eight-year-olds, but um, the air which adjusts the food stuff within the stomach and which sometimes sounds as belching is called samana. The air which passes through the throat and the stoppage of which, which constitutes suffocation is called the udana air. The total air and the total air which circ circulates throughout the entire body is called the dhyana air. Subtler than these five airs, there are others also. That which facilitates the opening of the eyes, mouth, etc. is called naga air. The air which increases the appetite is called krikra air. The air which helps contraction is called purna air. The air which helps relaxation by opening the mouth wide in yawning is called devadatta air. And of course everybody has experienced that if somebody in the classroom yawns, it's really contagious. 
So even reading the word yawning is a little dangerous. Um, and the air which helps sustenance is called Tananjaya air. All these airs are generated from the center of the heart, which is one only. So that's another way of seeing the one, um, at least among these aggregates of airs. And the heart is a very important thing. Um, Radhesha alluded to it a little bit yesterday. Um, and and you know, we see people, especially like the, there's, there's this uh, group called HeartMath. They, they really focus on, on getting people into their hearts, like through meditation on your breath and stuff like this. And it's really, I mean, what they, the perspective that they present, which seems to have a, a lot of scientific um, support, is really interesting. And so, how does it go? The, the electromagnetic field generated by the heart is like something like 60 times stronger than the electromagnetic field generated by the brain. And there's another aspect of the heart um, as an organ of cognition that's actually uh, like a thousand times stronger than the brain is. So this is a really important thing to focus on is the heart. I, you know, I mean, I talk sometimes like, you know, my shyness, because of my shyness, I have to, if I get out of my head and into my heart, then, um, then I can sing. Otherwise, I'm just going to be too self-conscious and gonna realize my voice isn't as great now as it was 60 years ago. Um, 55 or 60 years ago when I was a teenager and I was a really good singer. But really, we do we want to kind of like learn to move our airs and our emotions through, you know, I mean, our breath kind of figuratively and our emotions through our heart so that we really get in touch with them. Of course, sometimes that can be a little over powering as well, as we sometimes experience in some of our conversations with devotees. Um, I, I can just think of, in the last three days, maybe a half dozen conversations with a couple of devotees here, where one or more of us found ourselves going like this, or <laughs> trying to get down into our diaphragm so that we can keep breathing, because we touch on something that's um, a little um, overpowering. All these airs are generated from the center of the heart, which is one only. This central energy is superior energy of the Lord, who is seated within the heart with the soul of the body. We sometimes think of the mind as being in the head. I mean, this is kind of how we think of it as Westerners. Because we think of the mind as a, what do they call it? As being a product of the brain somehow. There's a, there's a technical term that's used in, in the science of, uh, of consciousness that uh, escapes me at the moment, or as Radhesha would say, is running away from me. Um, but actually, the, you know, the, the, the mind is probably more um, accurately seen as centered in the heart where all these things are generated. The head's just got this kind of computer thing up there that's, that analyzes things a lot um, and, and is more directly connected with the external senses. This is explained in the Bhagavad Gita. Seated within the heart and soul of the body who acts under the guidance of the Lord. This is explained in the Bhagavad Gita as follows. Sarvasya chaam ritisam nivishto matasmati vyam apohan cha. Vidais to sarvaya dhamme vavedyo vidanta kritveda vidayva chaam. Complete central force is generated from the heart. Sarvasya chaam ritisis as ritisam nivishto. We see this. Um, the heart emphasized so much throughout uh, the Bhagavad Gita and especially in the Bhagavatam. Uh, it's like at the end of the Rasa dance when King Parikit poses his question to uh, uh, Shukadeva Goswami, wait, I don't get it, after hearing these five chapters. <laughs> wait, he's like, uh, you know, he's like the representation of everything dharmic and he's hanging out in the middle of the night with unmarried girls and, and other people's wives? How do, how do I square that circle? And, and Shukadev Goswami uh, responds, essentially he's responding, well, wait a minute, what you, here's what, what you don't understand is these pastimes of Vishnu, Vishnu 
Um, these pastimes of Vishnu are so powerful that if we hear them uh, with the right attitude from um, a proper source, they are, this is the cure. This is the real cure for Hrdroga, for the heart disease that really afflicts us. It doesn't have anything to do with accumulated fats or anything. It has have some, a lot to do with accumulated uh, mal-impressions. Um, and that heart disease is our, our lust, our thirst for enjoying um, things in this world. The conditioned state is due the complete, central, the complete central force is generated from the heart by the Lord who is seated there and who helps the conditioned soul in remembering and forgetting. The conditioned state is due to the soul's forgetfulness of his relationship of subordination to the Lord. One who wants to continue to forget the Lord is helped by the Lord to forget him, help birth after birth. So he says in this verse, um, and from me come remembrance and forgetfulness. Whatever it is you think you need, I'll take care of that for you. I'll help. I can help. I'm here with you the whole way. But one who remembers him by dint of association with the devotee of the Lord has helped to remember him more and more. Thus the conditioned soul um, can ultimately go back home, back to Godhead. The process of transcendental help is described by, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita as follows, Tesham satata yuktanam vajatam vriti guru vakam tadami buddhi yoga matam yena mahu kriyantite. The buddhi yoga process of realization with intelligence transcendental to the mind, devotional service, can alone elevate one from the conditioned state of material entanglement in the cosmic construction. The conditioned state of the living entity is like that of a person in the depths of a huge mechanical arrangement. That's why I was feeling lost this morning, trying to figure out how, what, what is, you know, what is it about this that, that I can do that makes it all work right? And I was just lost in all this thing. And we, and, you know, we, I mean, you look at our skin, we don't have, we don't really have a sense of what's all the stuff that's going on in, you know, in the body. And, you know, we, we can't even see just right past the layer of the epidermis. There's a really, I remember when I was um, um, running a Gurukula ashram at Bhaktivedanta, Bhaktivedanta village many years ago. Uh, my parents gave us as a, 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 a Christmas gift, I think, a subscription to National Geographic magazine. And it was cool because it was, you know, not just for our family, but it was for the boys in the ashram. They had stuff they could read that could help them kind of see what, was, you know, what the world was about. And, and, you know, we could talk about it. And there was a, an article on this uh, city um, le less famous than, um, uh, you know, at the base of Vesuvius, less famous than Pompeii, uh, and that is Herculaneum. And they did a kind of reconstruction based on the fossilized form of some woman um, as to what she might look like, and they did it like later by layer, from, you know, from, I guess from the skeleton outward. And, and then they had one just before they put the epidermis over that showed muscles and fat and stuff. And, and you see in the scriptures how, you know, a brahmachari should, you know, if the brahmachari finds himself attracted to a woman's form, he should just see how it's different arrangements of muscles and fat. And there it was on this page of National Geographic, quite, quite graphically, and I just thought, oh, well, that doesn't look <laughs> as cool, <laughs> you know, as, as what, you know, guys are always imagining or something like that. You just, that one little, and then you get down to the, uh, oh, boy, anyway, the other stuff. All that machinery that makes it work, and it's, it's so bewildering to us to, you know, to kind of um, see how this, you know, how this stuff is all Together. The mental speculators can reach the point of buddhi yoga after many, many lifetimes of speculation, but the intelligent person begins from the platform of intelligence above the mind. I'm sorry, uh, the intelligent person who begins 
uh, from the platform of intelligence above the mind makes ra rapid progress in self-realization. Because the buddhi yoga process entails no fear of deterioration or ret retrogression at any time. And I'm going to put it. Where's my little leaf? Krishna, when I need him. Oh, I want to put a pin there uh, because I want to. The, the, uh, Radhesha mentioned the uh, tree uh, padvi bhuti and ek padvi bhuti. I want to come back to that because it, it, it's suggested here. Where was I? Oh, entails no fear of deterioration or retrogression at any time. It is, it is the guaranteed path to self-realization is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. The mental speculators cannot understand that the two birds, was it you? I was discussing, I was discussing this with somebody and I was trying to think, oh, the du duaparna, the two birds. We were discussing, yeah. Um, I was thinking Shreta Sotar Upanishad, but because of my habit of self-doubt, I was shooting that one down, thinking, well, maybe it's a Quran or something. But it's a very Upanishadic idea. Um, two birds sitting in the tree um, are the soul and the super soul. The individual soul eats the fruit of the tree, while the other bird does not eat the fruit of the tree, but only observes the activities of the eating bird. Without attachment, the witnessing bird helps the fruit-eating bird perform fruitful activities. Of course, if you turn more toward that bird, then the help it gives um, also helps you uh, find him. One who cannot understand this difference between the soul and the super soul, or God and the living entities, is certainly still in the entang entanglement of the cosmic machinery and must um, await the time when he will be free um, of, from bondage. And I'm out of time. And I, but I had a couple of things I was going to. Um, I, I want to make I, I want to make a couple of points really quickly. Um, we are, um, if we and, and this this is building from uh, the second canto, which makes uh, really clear to us that all in all this stuff, in, in all these uh, discussions, we're really talking about one truth. Um, uh, so there is one truth, one, um, Prabhupada says, one non-dual substance. Substance, I, I find that a, a word that complicates things for me. And, and, and I like that. I like when things complicate. But I haven't really figured this out. But at least one essence, anyway. Maybe uh, more, more subtle substance, um, but it's seen in different ways by people uh, with different perspectives because of different adhikar, because of different um, qualifications that they ha um, have attained. Some are able to see it as this one kind of non-dual substance, and then they mistake that. Um, well, once, once they actually see that, and they they, they see that they identify some, they can identify with it somehow. They they end up making the mistake of identifying it with it with it entirely, and think they become they become the whole thing. Um, so that's the Maya body idea, and then they think that people who um, see themselves as somehow separate from that are are covered by some form. Of, of illusion of Maya, so we call them Maya bodies. The Brahma bodies are um, like Shukadeva Goswami, the four Kumaras, the Atmaramas. Um, they also identify with it, but they see that they're small, as we've seen, as we saw in these purports. They're small, and so there's a tendency for them to be influenced by their environment. That's what the meaning of Tattasta Shakti. Sometimes covered, but you know, the, the, some, the tata is the, that area on the bank of a river or a, a, an ocean beach, maybe, or a, 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 the beach of a lake. It's sometimes covered by water and sometimes exposed um, to the air. Sometimes dry, and it appears to be dry land. So we're like that. We're, you know, we have a tendency to, to be influenced by 
um, our environment, which is why we try, as Prabhupada says in today's purport, the second purport, we try to keep ourselves in the association of devotees, at least for like intimate association, for really serious discussion, and for real exchanges uh, of respect and affection and things like that. Um, because that kind of association uh, keeps us immersed in the ocean of the nectar of devotion. Uh, whereas the other kind of association, association with um, people who are influenced by the three modes of material nature, keep us high and dry up on the beach, um, gasping for air like a fish out of water. So we've got this one substance, Brahman, which constitutes everything, as we saw in the last canto. Everything is Krishna, and Krishna, in a sense, is everything. And at the same time, he stays aloof. And so this oneness is, at the, is actually at the base of all the different perspectives of the four Vaishnava Sampradayas. This is one more thing I wanted to get in. I'm going to have to trash one so that everybody doesn't completely reject me. Um, so if we look at the, just the names of the four tattvas taught by the four different Sampradayas, we see Advaita at the core, that's at the base of all of them, the root of all of them. So the Kumara Sampradaya, uh, the Nimbarka Sampradaya, their philosophy is called Dvaita Dvaita Vada. It's dualistic monism. It's one substance, but it's manifested as the Jiva and, and the absolute truth, God. Um, the Shiva Sampradaya, the Shiva Sampradaya coming from uh, Shiva or Rudra, um, which is the Vishnu Swami, uh, Sampradaya, or the, uh, the more modern uh, manifestation, the Pushkimar coming from Vallabhacharya, theirs is called Shuddha Dvaita, purified monism. So everything, everything is God, like gold, uh, the gold in the gold mine. You know, you've got the ornaments made from gold in the gold mine, they're essentially the same substance. And then you have the Sri Sampradaya coming from Lakshmi. Um, which comes to us through Ramanujacharya, and their philosophy is called the Vish. I have, to, I have, I printed a slide out from my one of my uh, presentations on the four uh, sampradayas because I mess up with lists sometimes, even lists of three. I get lost sometimes in a list of three. So theirs is called the Vishishta Dvaita, or a qualified monism. So it's a different way of saying yes, the, the living entities and the absolute truth, they're the same substance, but there's, a, but there's also kind of a difference. And so that, that is that the absolute truth is the complete whole, and the living entities are amshas, as we saw here, uh, atmamsha, in, in the seventh verse uh, from today. So it's a um, qualified monism. And um, ours, um, well, we have two forms in our sampradaya, coming from Lord Brahma. From Madhvacharya, it's called Shuddha Dvaita Vada. So it's purified dualism, Shuddha Dvaita. Not to be confused with Shuddha Dvaita, which is purified monism, which is completely an, an easy problem to make because when you look at them, they're spelled the same, with a, a long A ah, um, in there because of the Sanya. And um, so that purified dualism is that there's two, but they're also, um, they're, really, they're really the same um, essence. And then um, from Lord Chaitanya, we get the original teaching, not just of the Bhagavatam, but of the Vedas as well. And, and that is um, what uh, Srila Jiva Goswami styled as uh, achintya peda apeda. Um, inconceivable uh, difference and non-difference. Um, inconceivable simultaneous difference and non-difference. So in other words, the Lord and the living entities are the same and different, and that is uh, that takes place um, by way of the Lord's inconceivable energies. So this Advaita is really kind of at the base uh, of all the Vaishnava philosophies. And, and the Vaishnava philosophies are all refutations of the Kevala Dvaita Vada, 
of, of, of Shankaracharya, which is that just there's just one thing. And if you think not, that means you're in Maya. That's proof that you're in Maya. If you think that you're somehow in, uh, somehow uh, have some sense of individuality from the complete Brahman, then you haven't realized yet. So you're still in Maya. So it's really complicated. I wanted to do the Ekapad tri, uh, Vibhuti and Tripad Vibhuti. I do that, I'll do that in one minute. Um, so generally, and this is how we pretty consistently hear from Srila Prabhupada, we think of it in quantitative terms. Three quarters of the living entities are in the spiritual world in one quarter. You know, or, or three quarters of the overall energy is the spiritual world and one quarter is the little cloud in the corner which is the material world. But what we're talking about is innumerable living entities in the material world even. Not to mention, um, certainly innumerable living entities in, in the spiritual world. Um, so uh, uh, in another sense, as we see in the Bhagavad Sandarpa, uh, they're explained as in, a, in qualitative terms. So the spiritual realm is characterized by three qualities. Okay, now I'm gonna to have to look. Because it's another list. Oh, so those, uh, the, the three qualities are um, amrita, amrita, amritva, uh, being full of bliss, abhaya, fearless, um, and shema, or being absolutely secure. Um, in other words, you know, uh, you, you know who you are. Um, so, and, and the material world is characterized by one quality, which is mortality, which is not very secure, right? It's not secure at all, because we're always worried about, you know, we're thinking about, oh, you know, this is, this is our big fear um, of death. Because we identify with that, you know, with that kind of life, because the mortality is always looming, we're always worried about forgetting it and losing um, ourselves, losing our sense um, of self. So this is, um, you know, kind of another way to see that ekpad vibhuti, tripad vibhuti kind of thing in a qualitative sense, which um, uh, complicates it, which uh, sometimes is a good thing. So I'm going to, well, that was a minute and a half. So I'm going to stop and see if there are any quick questions or comments, because Krishna is waiting for us. This part of here is that uh, because the Muni Yoga process entails either deterioration or retrogression at any time, it is the guaranteed path to self-realization is completely So we're referring perhaps maybe to even physical atrophy and... I'm sorry? Is that, does that include even physical atrophy and the deterioration of the body? Into that nature? The well, it's the nature of the material energy. Right. That entropy is part of the nature of the material energy. Things wear down. Uh, things fall apart. Was it Yates wrote? Uh, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Um, so some some sort of entropy is is always there in the material energy. So the material world runs in cycles. There is time. In the material world, there's no time as we can conceive of it um, in the spiritual world. Although there's time so that different leelas can take place. You know, you've got nighttime pastimes and daytime pastimes, morning pastimes, noon pastimes. So times they're just like there's no the Bhagavad Gita says there's no need of a sun or a moon there, but they're there as decorations. I mean, if with, without a full moon, what's a rasa dance, right? It's got to be super romantic. You've got to have the whole, got to have the whole enchilada there, you know. You've got the full moon and you know, and the forest and, and the stars and everything, and uh, you know, you're out there uh, dancing with Krishna. So, um, you know, and engaging, yeah. In, I mean, the, the engaging in the buddhi yoga process means I, uh, separating. Separating, using our intelligence to, to, to see how we're separate. I was going to say separating ourselves from these different elements, but what that really means is just understanding how we're separate from those things.
how we're lost in this big, a little bitty spark lost in this big machine. Little bitty, but powerful enough to make the whole thing go. You know, powerful enough to do sometimes amazing things with, you know, with this, you know, with this machine. Like Laird Hamilton writing insane waves and things like that. Does that help? It does. Can I tell the Shaolin disciple for a long time? So I have all of these, um, these forms and all of these intricate patterns of movements stored in my mind. And in the past, I've managed to accomplish being able to perform all of those things in the city. I felt a certain sense of um, self-realization from that. Hmm. In this stage, I, it's difficult for me to allow my body, to feel my body atrophy and to sort of uh, become weaker and still feel like I'm making spiritual progress. And maybe I can feel myself sort of collapsing from all into the day. Feel it acutely, and it's difficult. To, it's difficult to know the, know that, and to dismiss my body and to feel progressive. And know that yeah. So therefore, we get we become centered in the heart. Like med a lot of the, the meditation that you see um, has a lot to do with the heart. Um, if you read the Yoga Sutras, as I pointed out, about one percent of the Yoga Sutras has to do with asana out of the 1200 words there's like 11 words that address asana and the whole idea behind asana is keep your body in shape so you can sit right and exactly. focus on the heart exactly and train so hard just to sit still right you know, yeah you work hard so you can sit still yeah. um so yeah that you know once we become you know and and once we're able to focus on both you know, the heart the, and the, this this understanding of heart is the heart as much more than just a pump as important and powerful as that is it's it's something that's much more on you know on a much subtler level um, so uh, so yeah yeah all these things you know there are connections among all these different things and, and uh, to the extent that you're worship well, uh, uh, witnessing at, uh, atrophy now <laughs> You ain't seen nothing yet. Buckle uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Grantaraj Shri Matagatam Kijaya.